Eddie Hearn does not stop. He is always wheeling and dealing on that phone of his. Anyway, welcome back. Eddie Hearn, how are you? The problem is with the phone is I finish in there and then like I open up my phone. It's like, I don't know, 30 WhatsApps. And I look at like three or four of them and I'll do another interview and then I come back and then it's 40 and then it's like, and you never get a chance to actually deal with it all. Do you know what I mean? But what can I say? You gave me a book, so. I didn't want to mention that. It's all right. But how do you, this is the, and the thing is, I think that's why you'll find it interesting. Mm -hmm. You're someone, a businessman, that likes things done properly. Mm -hmm. Your father taught you that. You sat on his knee, you learnt the tricks of the trade, and you're carrying that on now. Bigger things have come from it. Do you think you'd ever be able to trust anyone to be able to say, look at those 30, 40 WhatsApps for me, you deal with that Why I do this? Yeah, I think um, I one of my biggest weaknesses actually over the last, I'm better now, is actually allowing people to do things. So... Um, when we started in boxing, it was me, Frank Smith, and John Wish, John Wishhausen, right? Who worked for Matrim for years. And I did Twitter, the whole social media, designed the posters, booked the venues, made the, like, so, and it was always my thing. Like, I wanted to build the fights, the card, the show, myself build the artwork, the narrative all the way through. And when you have to, now we have a design team of four or five people who create graphics and, you know, styles of posters. And But to give them that responsibility was quite difficult for me. And to delegate, and, and that's what I've become very good at. When you start trusting people, when you build a team of people that are very good, it's a lot easier to delegate. So Frank Smith, for example, I would allow him to deal with everything for me. And... We make a great team because I'm the mouth and I can sell like nobody else. And he is um, precise, you know, he is organized. He, yeah, and, and I'm not. So we work really well together in that respect. But what I'm trying to do is just to build a business where they don't need me. Do you know what I mean? Why? In time. In time because AJ said something the other day. We went for a walk in Dallas. We were walking around the park and this guy stops and he's like, oh, Anthony Joshua, this American guy. He says, and AJ's like, AJ's quite weird in the sense that he will stop, which is amazing really, and he will talk to this guy for 10 minutes, but he'll start asking him questions. He's one of those guys, right? So it's like, which is amazing really. Like mostly you'd think people would just go, mate, leave me alone. I'm just going for a walk. So the guy comes over and he says, I'm saying so, I'm 21. I'm um, a legal graduate and I see you walking around this park all the time, but I thought today I'd just come and so AJ says, ask, why, why today? And the guy's like, what do you mean? He goes, what made you stop today? You said you see me. I said, I don't know. I just sort of kept thinking to do it, but now I've done it. And the guy said to him, can I ask you a question? He said, what possesses you after all of this to keep going the way you're going and what drives you? And AJ said, you know, when I started out in this sport, when I decided to dedicate myself to this sport, I said to myself at a particular moment, and I think it was just before the, the kind of Olympics or a year before, I'm going to give this 10 years of my life and I'm going to give everything to it. I'm not going to cut any corners. I'm going to make sacrifices, you know, whether that's relationships, whether that's my social life, whatever that might be, my mind, and I'm going to put my whole spirit into this and I thought you know what that's exactly what I've done really and I just thought to myself and I started thinking to myself because I feel like when he goes he won't go forever like you'll see him but when I go I want to be the same way I don't want to start doing punditry on you know top of turn up maybe I won't be able to yeah because I love talking boxing I love the sport but I feel like when you invest in something so heavily there'll come a time where you just go Time's up. Bye. Do you know what I mean? Just like that? Yeah. Not not, not just, I won't wake up one morning and go, bye. But I, I think like, when well, my old man's 75, right? He's supposed to have retired. He's in the office nearly every day. Like he can't. And I look at like Aram, I look at Warrior, and I just think, nah, not for me. But maybe it'd be difficult to walk away. But what, the way I'm playing it in my mind is, I'm knocking my cods out every day. Can't give any more. Like, and because I'm thinking, soon, 
not like next year or whatever, but soon-ish, you'll be done. Do you know what I mean? So give it everything. And then when it's done, that's the difference between me and my dad. My dad will stay at it. Go, I'm going, I actually want to not disappear, but I want to go and live life. I want to, like, I haven't been able to do things like what I wanted to do, but I've lived a great life and I've done something I believe in, which is more powerful than anything. But at the same time, the aggravation, like it's, it's a very taxing business boxing, very taxing business. And I actually learned something the other day around this event, which was you mustn't let anyone dim your flame, right? Or put your fire out. Because when this fight was announced, like when this fight got made, I'm like sitting there going, Jesus, it's AJ against Dillian at the O2. This is massive. This is what British boxing needs actually right now. This is what Matrim need. It's what DAZN need. This is massive. And you're like, you go online and it's like the usual Twitter, like, oh, this, this is a joke fight. This, I'm thinking, wait a minute, like AJ... You want to see a joke fight? You should have seen some of the fights I was putting forward to AJ. Right? We're fighting Deontay Wilder in December and he's having an interim fight against Dillian. Like, it's a, what a brilliant fight. And then I start reading too much online. And I sat down with Frank Smith like four days ago and I was like, oh, do you think it'll sell out? And he's like, yeah. I was like, I don't know, because like, I've read a bit, you know, it seems to be a bit of negativity. And he's like, mate, We've just done the pre-sale. There were 7,000 people in a queue in the pre-sale for like 1,500 tickets. Like this fight is it? And obviously today we sell out in a couple of hours. I'm like, stop. You know, you mustn't let people dim your light. If you believe in something and you're good at what you do and you work hard, nothing should get in your way. But it's very easy to let negativity creep in and doubt yourself. And I think that's a good lesson to me. It was very unusual for me to do that, actually. It was a bit, bit of a weakness. But I don't mind saying it because I think it's good for others to understand as well. If you believe in something, don't let someone who doesn't really want you to succeed or doesn't have any ambition themselves drain it out of you. So you just turn around and go, nah, do you know what? We won't make that fight or we'll do it in a smaller venue. Or, you know, because it was that same ambition that got me to where I am. Like when we did Frotch Groves, I just went, fucking let's do Wembley. And everyone's going, like my dad went to me, don't do Wembley. Like, are you mad? And I went, no, no, we'll do it. Come on, bang. And the next thing sold it out. Like, if I went in with that attitude from last week, maybe I would have gone, oh, actually, let's go back to MEN. And that's, you know, got to be careful. So I won't be doing that again. No, but it's interesting that you say that because it's kind of like you and Anthony Joshua have got sort of like a parallel career. Mm. Different, yeah. but parallel. He was, in his last fight, he said, I'm more cautious. I've got to think about risk, which is exactly what you've just explained as in getting these fights made. There's that, just that little bit of doubt where you've got to be a little bit cautious. It comes with maturity, I guess. Yeah, but it also comes with building something. Like, at the end of the day, like, if you don't have a lot or you're willing to roll the dice more. And that's the same with fighters. You know, all of a sudden they build up a legacy. They build up belts. They build up the ability to earn money. They want to take less risk. It's natural. It's not great for the sport. But the same with us, like, we don't need to be out there taking risks like we used to, but we just want to keep pushing the boundaries. But I think that comes with comes with success, really, in terms of what you do. Like, you just become more mature. AJ was brilliant today, like, with the writers, they went to him, do you feel like you've lost a little bit of that sort of killer instinct? He went, no, I just didn't know what I was doing. He went, so if I had someone hurt, I didn't know how to break them down or think, this is 12 rounds, let's pick them apart, work the body. I just thought, shit, just get him out of there. Like, and I, would, I, would, I was like thinking, I don't really know what I'm doing. And it, it all made sense, you know, because we never knew what we were doing when we started out either. But now you're just a little bit more calculated, you're a little bit mature, maturer, you're a little bit more protective of what you've built. And therefore you just move in a different way. It's interesting that you say that because we talk about like taking risks. This was a fight that initially you was like, nah, I can't see it happening. I remember when we spoke, when he was fighting Franklin and you were saying, the reason why we didn't do Dillian, a harder fight to make, venue, money, all of that came into it. And then it was sort of like, Dillian went out onto obviously doing his, his uh, tour on TalkSport. And then it was like, okay, nah, it's not, I can't see it happening. And then all of a sudden, it happens because I was convinced it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I didn't think it would happen because whenever someone starts going to TalkSport, and I'm thinking, I've just sent you an email. Literally two minutes later, you're doing an interview on TalkSport. So are you trying to get a little bit of profile to make another fight? Then I put a rematch clause in. It's business. AJ said, take it out. I don't care. The money was small because we'd already booked the O2. 
I thought Dillian won't take that deal. He's made that clear in his email. And then every time I went back to AJ and said, what about Wallin? What about Caballel? He'd go, well, is Dillian just not up for it? I'm like, no, he just like he won't take the offer. Anyway, came back, signed the contract, and like it was like that. So I'm very surprised that both men have taken it. But I respect it. And I think I actually think it's the right fight for both. Because in boxing, you can really lose your mojo fighting in fights that you're just not motivated to be in and sometimes you can get beat in those fights so I think it's the perfect fight for both getting prepared for a fight for Wilder I know this is sort of like coming in the interim bracket I know it isn't because Dillian is Dillian and Wilder is Wilder would you have preferred if there was no fight in between now and December only because possible injury risks yeah. that will push the fight back you saying that you know basically that big offer might not be there should AJ not win I know that I, I, I love a pound note, right? But I love winning. All right. And I don't, although the Wilder fight will make AJ a lot of money and therefore me a lot of money, I want him to win that fight. And I know that if he can go in with momentum, with another fight under his belt with Derek James, with victory over Dillian White, he will be in a much better place to win that fight. And we've 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 got to a stage with AJ, like he's made enough money. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I think part of his mindset of taking this fight was if I can't beat Dillian White, I don't think I can beat Deontay Wilder. And therefore, if I lose, I lose. And I deserve to lose. But if I beat him, I think I can knock Wilder out. And I think, you know. And it's difficult because I've worked with Dillian for a long time. Everyone knows, like, obviously, AJ, we're, we're close with him. But I wish both guys the best. And I think the winner will fight Deontay Wilder. But I just like AJ's mentality here of many fighters would have gone, oh, no, just leave it. Just go on and then start training in, like, September. But he was like, no, I want to fight. And the, the one thing I noticed about going out to camp was how better he seems to be gelling with Derek James after that first fight. And that's key. Like, you can gel in the gym. But to go through this fight, I think we'll put him in a better position if he wins. You know, if he loses, we'll go, well, oh, fucking idiots. Why didn't we just go straight to the Wilder fight? But you you go, you want to go into that Wilder fight prepared to win, not for a payday. And this will give him, I think, better confidence to do that. You've touched on something there that I picked up at the presser. Obviously, Derek James isn't here because he's in camp with his other champions. AJ said, like, with his chest, mm. with confidence almost like he's so happy with his trainer. I've never seen him speak like that about a trainer before. You've known him from the very beginning. Your thoughts on that? His confidence in his trainer? I think he's just happy. As, like, he, he's a remarkable individual. Like, he's, weird's the wrong word, but like, when I go around there, so I walked in, yeah, he's got like, he's kind of like gadget obsessed as well. So ev he wants, everything's about improving or bettering himself, yeah? So, like, I go in there, and he's got, like, some ice thing, compression thing on something, and he's got these blue light glasses on. He's got this thing around his neck which holds his phone so his hands are red. Like, he's he's got this touch thing which you've seen him do on the wall, like, for your mind. They play chess. They do this other... They dim the lights at this touch. Do you know what I mean? So it's like he's got a masse masseuse. He's got a cold plunge out the back. It's like... And the house is, like, very humble like just on some Texas road in Dallas and I sort of walk in there I look at him I think you really still want it do you know what I mean like it's not someone said to him the thing oh you know when you're wearing silk pajamas are you at that stage it's like mate he's far removed from that and like he has no glamour in his life at all so they never go out they never go to I mean like you imagine like a young man with tens of millions in Dallas, looking like Anthony Joshua. I mean, you'd expect him to be in the club, in the dinner, in the bars. He's like, just get me home, put me blue light glasses on, me compression, I'll have a little go of that, we'll have a game of chess, and that's me done. And let me monitor my sleep. Do you know what I mean? So to do all that, you must want it so bad still, which is a great sign. But I find him, I've always found him fascinating, always found his energy so good as well, like, being around him sometimes, a bit tired and low. Whenever you leave him, you're sort of like, you know, he's just a good guy. Good guy, funny guy, but made unbelievable sacrifices to get to where he's got to. And when you hear him talking about, 
I'm just starting to get it to understand boxing. Like, you're thinking, fuck me. You, I think, maybe I'm biased, I think he might be, able, might be about to flick a little switch in his career of actually dominating fights, beating people up, looking good, having the confidence to do that. Because he said, when I fought Dillian before, I didn't even know how to defend. He said, I was like, I just thought, fuck, just, he's hurt. Just get him out of there. I, 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 I didn't think I'd go 12 rounds. So I just thought, fuck, just let the kitchen sink go. And he said, then I'd do that and I'd gas in fights because I just didn't know what I was doing. And now he actually, he's a student of the game. But listen, heavyweight boxing, anything can happen. The standard of fighter, it seems like he's set a bar. So when you see somebody that has had how many fights, defences, one, lost, one, lost. Where does that set the bar for the type of fighter that you want in your on your team? You said that you've got some spare Canelo money now. Yeah, yeah. So you can invest in fighters. What do you want from your fighters? Because AJ is going to retire eventually. Yeah. You're going to need another superstar, yeah. someone with that energy. Yeah, I mean, you need you want a fighter with character and personality and, and that star quality. But you also want a fighter. I love fighters like... I don't know, Rocky Hernandez, right? This is a Mexican kid who boxed at the weekend. He's number one. He's going to fight a Shaky Foster. He's like 29 and one, 28 knockouts. And he's like, he don't really speak English, but he just says, boss, just put me in. Put me in. You know, and I'm thinking, fuck me, you are a right handful, you are. Do you know what I mean? And I know, I'll put him into a fight. He will give you everything. Do you know what I mean? Not, oh, you know, I'm not really feeling it at the moment in camp and, oh, you know, I'm a, it's like, he's just like, just let me out, you know, and I love that. So, well, I'm not saying everyone's like that, but just people who, tough fuckers, do you know what I mean? Like, that's what you need to make it in this sport. You've got to be a tough, tough fucker. You've got to be fit. You've got to have power, if you can. You've got to have a good chin and you've got to have a great mentality. And a lot of these Mexican fighters have all that. Where they lack is their discipline. So when they make money, life changes. And that's where they're not as good. Lara's a great example, you know, and, and hundreds of Mexican fighters in the past. But when they're there, like when he came over, Lara, and fought Josh Warrington in the bubble, like, I didn't even know, but like just a beat, like, I'm like, Rocky Hernandez, Sugar Nunes, you know, all these guys, Angel Fierro. They're just like, light the torch paper and let them go. Do you know what I mean? And that, for me, is the most exciting thing. And, you know, fighters that want to be great. Sonny Edwards, another example. Like, he's getting good money to fight Bam Rodriguez, but it was never really about the money. It was just like, just give me the chance. Give me the chance to fight the best because I know I'm going to beat him. Boxing has become, and, and it's a high-risk sport, so I understand it, but it's been, become a sport that's dominated by money. Decisions regarding money. That's why I like Dillian's decision here because he's not getting the right deal if it was a stadium final. He's getting the right deal for the O2, but there is more money in the pot if we waited another six weeks and we built it right. But in the end, it was like, mate, that's the money. And it was like, fuck it. I think I can win. Let's go. That's really, that's really refreshing to see rather than a, an agent phoning me up trying to get another 250 and like, it's not there. And it's like, ah, oh, and it's, then you slow it down and he pisses you off. And then it's like, you end up taking another fight. Both these guys just went, yeah, like, like neither of them are earning the money they could have earned if it was at Wembley or this, but they just went, yes, yeah, a good fight. Let's go. Like not being funny when you got that kind of money, does it really matter? I mean, that's when you talk about fury, Like he's turned down, I don't know, 70 or 80 million to fight Usyk. Like, does it really matter if you didn't get 90, but you got 80 or seven? Like, do you know what I mean? If you're going to, but that's, yeah, that's where sport becomes frustrating. But we have a lot of stuff online and there's transparency. There's so much transparency when it comes to how boxing businesses run before social media. Mm. I'm not saying things. There, there is, but there's also so much bollocks. I mean, I had a conversation with someone the other day and they went to me, they said to me, I've heard, right, four different things. Most of them about my fighters. And I'm like, I can't believe people are actually saying that about someone about this person's left that trainer. They're about to sign with that trainer. It's like total bollocks, right? I'm like, people just waffle absolute rubbish. That's what I'm saying about dimming your light. Just focus on what you believe in, what you know, and don't start, always learn, but don't worry about listening to someone 
you know, no disrespect to someone who works in a post office, but you can't start edu telling me what sells and what doesn't. And like, I can't tell you the best way to send a special delivery. Do you know what I'm saying? That's your field. You're the expert. Believe in what you do. Trust yourself and work hard. This is what I do. Doesn't mean I won't let people take, give me advice or I won't take things in, but just focus. And that's the problem now with social media. Everyone's an expert. Like, and they don't know, like, you know, it's like Simon Jordan. No, now he's bright, he's intelligent, but I don't mean to be rude, but don't try and educate me about my business that I worked in all, virtually all my life and I live and breathe it 24-7. Like when he had his phone shops or whatever, I wouldn't come to you and say, oh, I reckon this plan's better than that plan, or, or whatever. So, but it's easy to get discouraged in life by people making you doubt yourself. So don't doubt yourself. I could talk to you for 780 years, but I know you're all talked out. And you've given me 21 minutes of your time, which is brilliant. Yeah. And as per usual, I'm grateful. Hopefully I'll see you fight week. You're the one that always opens up the door for me. And I really do appreciate your no time. Way. Thanks for the book. I'm off to LA and Detroit and I'll start reading it on the plane. Definitely. Thank you. You'll like it. There's three of them. Hi, and thank you for watching October Red Boxing. Like, subscribe and tap the bell for notifications. You can also find us on Instagram at October Red Boxing and on Twitter, October Red UK. And remember, at October Red, we stay ready.